We do not need more preachers, churches, or missionaries, but we do need more people who know how to pray. That's some of the wisdom our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, shares today on Through the Bible. Welcome. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're here as the Bible bus is headed through Luke chapter 11. But before we take off on our journey, we've got some time to enjoy just one letter from the Bible bus, and it's a really good one. Here is what Kathy from New Zealand sent us. Thank you for being such a faithful voice for so long. It's always wonderful to hear you. I used to listen to Through the Bible with my mom in her art studio in the mornings when we were together in Zimbabwe. So when I hear your voice, I have so many happy memories. I was recently given an iPhone and downloaded your app and so have been able to listen as often as I like. I am currently on a sales trip in Wellington. We have now lived in New Zealand for nearly 14 years and I have listened to most of Genesis while driving between appointments. What a wonderful way to spend my days. Thank you all for your faithfulness and zeal in bringing us God's word. This is how Jesus said we would overcome, by the word of our testimonies and by the sword of the Spirit. His beautiful word. I do so love hearing how the Lord is so mighty to save in even the most remote and hostile places on earth. May he bless and sustain every one of those precious ones who have come to know him by faith. Well, isn't that a great letter? Now let's pray and commit this time to the Lord. Lord, would you use this time to teach us more about how we can communicate better with you through prayer? Quiet our hearts, Lord, and give us a hunger to spend more time in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now shall we turn to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke and I'd like to read this first verse to get us into the atmosphere of this chapter. In fact, the first three verses. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now I've read, actually, the first four verses of this particular section. This, by the way, is, I think, a very important section that we're in right now. It deals with prayer, and actually it deals with prayer as you'll find it nowhere else in the Gospels. Now, it may sound similar to another section, but it's not at all. Fact of the matter is, this little section here, a great many feel like it just doesn't fit here. It's an insertion that it's a sort of an intrusion in the chronological account of the ministry of Christ. Well, you can't fit it in to a particular place here. I do not think that's essential. But as we come to this chapter, we see that this first verse suggests many interesting implications. You see, the reason his disciple wanted to know how to pray was because he saw Christ pray and he heard him. You see, it was the custom of our Lord to retire alone to pray. That was a habit of his. And this disciple saw him, evidently overheard him, and a desire was born in his heart to pray like Christ prayed. And do you know, friends, that the Lord Jesus is right at this moment at God's right hand, and he's our great intercessor, and it's still a very good thing to ask him to teach us to pray. I think that's a very appropriate petition for many of us to make. Lord, teach us to pray. There are many times in your experience, as I'm sure it's been in mine, I haven't known how to pray. I haven't known what to say. And you just say, my father. (laughs) And that's enough. He knows and he understands. Now, this man here, he was not asking just how to pray. He gave them that in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not asking for a technique or a system or an art form or a ritual. It's not how to pray, but teach me to pray. Not how to do it, but to do it. 
They wanted to pray as he prayed. You know, many folks say their prayers. It's sort of an amen to tag on to the end of the day when you put on your pajamas. I was brought up in a home in which I never heard prayer and never saw a Bible. And the first that I ever engaged in prayer, I went as a boy to a conference, and I stayed in a dormitory where the one in charge got the boys together for prayer. And everybody had to put on his pajamas and come, and we had prayer together. And you know, I got the impression at the very beginning that the thing to do was to pray when you put on your pajamas and that you couldn't pray any other time. In other words, your pajamas were sort of your prayer clothes because I'd never seen it done any other way than that. But frankly, we need someone today to teach us to pray. We need that. Not to just say our prayers, but to really get through to God. And you notice he says, as John also taught his disciples, and that's a bird's eye view of John, is it not? It's an unexpected glimpse into the life of this man. It's a sort of a farewell look at him because he'll not be before us again. This is the last picture that's taken of him. And what do we have? John was a man of prayer. They said, teach us just like John prayed. Is anybody going to say that about you or about me? All great servants of God have been men of prayer. And today, the barren life of Christians and the deadness in the church today is the result of prayerless lives. That's the problem today. Now, he gives them here what may sound to you like the so-called Lord's Prayer, but I believe that Christ didn't intend it to become the thing I hear in public service today. It's not a stilted form, and it's not for a public service. This was to be spontaneous. It was personal. This disciple asked, you see. It's to be like a conversation. And don't misunderstand me. I don't believe in conversational prayer where you meet in a group. But I think that when you and I go alone, we just should talk to God. After all, he's my father. And I'm his son. He knows me. And I don't think he wants me to put on airs and assume an unnatural voice and try to use some flowery language. I think he just wants me to talk like Vernon McGee talks. He doesn't want me to be wordy. I get so weary of hearing these wordy prayers today, and I think that sometimes maybe God says, turn him off, turn the dial. I've heard that fellow say that before. In fact, he says it all the time. You know, the greatest prayers in Scripture are brief prayers. The briefest prayer is, Lord, save me. And it was said by Simon Peter. And let's look at a few things in the prayer. First part's worship. God's honor, the kingdom is God's will on earth, and the prayer is the privilege of the redeemed. You couldn't pray for God's kingdom without knowing what it involves. It means putting down of evil, means putting up of the good. It means God's will in your life. There must be a desire for that. You can mouth these words, but there should be something back of it. And I'm not talking now to the unsaved. I personally do not think that this prayer is given for the lost. This is a prayer for the saved. There is a prayer for the unsaved, and it's God be merciful to me, a sinner. And actually, he doesn't even need to pray that prayer. It's simpler than that. You do not have to beg God to do something that he already is doing, to be something that he already is. God is merciful and he's able to extend mercy to you, and he wants to extend mercy to you. You don't have to beg him to save you. He will save you if you'll come to him. We have here a prayer, part of it, for physical provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Then he puts something down here that I can't measure up to. I may be wrong, but I don't think you can either. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. Do you forgive everyone? My friend, if God forgave us on the same basis that you and I forgive, we'd never be saved. Here's the standard for us. Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. 
God forgave us before we were forgiving, and it was when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You do not have to beg God to save you. He wants to save you. You don't have to struggle except the salvation he holds out to you. Now, if you're a child of God, it may be that you today need to pray a prayer like this and make you a man or a woman of prayer. That's what he wants to make of you. We don't need more preachers. We don't need more churches. And frankly, I don't think we need more missionaries. We need more people that know how to pray. And he's not through with prayer. Notice here he gives a parable, and only Luke gives us, and this is a tremendous one. When we get to the 18th chapter, we'll have another one. And my, what a different light this reveals about prayer. Now notice this, and this is a parable that is a little different than the other parables that we've had. It's a parable actually by contrast. And we're going to see that when we get to the 18th chapter. But let me just look at this one. He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Now, let me bring it up to date. Suppose here in Southern California, where we have many visitors that come to see us from back in the East, you know, and especially relatives. And here is a man and his wife. They have their children, and his mother-in-law writes that she's going to visit him. And so she says that she'll be in by the middle of the afternoon on a certain day. That day comes, and they decide that when the mother-in-law gets there, that they'll take her out for dinner. <laughs> and so they wait, and the middle of the afternoon comes, and they don't hear from the mother-in-law, and she doesn't arrive, and it gets on into the evening, and finally they get a call, and she said that they've had car trouble, and that it'll be late in the night before they get there, at least by 11, well, the stores are all closed by then, and they think, well, they'll certainly eat before they come to see them. And so, lo and behold, 11 o'clock comes, and they're still not there. 1 o'clock comes, and they drive up. Well, sir, they go out, the man to meet his mother-in-law, and he, of course, casually says, well, I guess you all have had your dinner. And she said, no, we were in such a big hurry and had so much trouble we didn't stop. And he says, my, I don't have anything in the house. So she said, well, we sure are hungry, and you know how mother-in-laws are. So he wonders what he's going to do. So he's got a good neighbor next door, and he goes next door, and he knocks on the door. And the neighbor says, who is it this time of the morning? And he says, well, I'm your neighbor next door. Oh, he says, what do you want? So well, I want to borrow some bread and meat or whatever you've got to eat. Oh, he says, wait till in the morning. You're not starving to death. I'm in bed. My children in bed. Go on home. And this fellow said, you don't know my mother-in-law. And so what does he do? I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he'll rise and give him as many as he needeth. The man says, you don't know my mother-in-law. Brother, you get up, and he pounds on the door. So the fellow gets up and gives him what he's asking for, you see. Now, this is the parable of contrast. Listen to this now. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that seeketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. My friend, do you think God is asleep? Do you feel like that he's gone to bed when you pray and you can't get him up? You feel like he doesn't want to answer your prayer? My friend, God wants to answer your prayer. And God will answer your prayer. And that's exactly what he's saying here. It's a wonderful thing, by the way. It teaches the very opposite, you see, of what you might think that this parable teaches. 
It's a parable by contrast, not by comparison. You do not have to storm the gates of heaven. You do not have to knock the door of heaven down. God's not reluctant to hear you, friend. He wants to answer your prayer. He says, before they call, I'll answer them. God wants to hear and answer your prayer. Well, somebody says, but he doesn't hear an answer. Well, maybe you ought to get the message, friend. He's telling you no. <laughs> Our problem is we don't like to take no for an answer. He always hears and answers the prayers of those that are his own, but he says no most of the time. He does to me. He says, you're not praying the thing that's best for you. And I've learned over the years that the best answer that God's ever given me to some of the requests I've made to him has been no. I prayed as a young preacher for God to open up a certain door to a certain church that I wanted to go to. And I told him to open the door, and I was asked to candidate, and the elders met and wanted to call me as pastor of the church. And then all the machinery in the church, the political bigwigs, they shut the door. They said that I couldn't come there because I'm no church politician, and that was a strategic church in that day. And I just went to the Lord and cried about it and told him how he let me down, you know. And I'm ashamed of myself today because I told him that. I've asked him to forgive me for saying it. He didn't let me down. You know what he said? He said, no. He says, my child, that place is not the best place for you. I have something better for you. And you know he did? And he answered my prayer. He said, no. And that was the best answer that could be given. You don't have to storm the gates of heaven. My friend, God hadn't gone to bed. The door there is wide open. He says, knock, seek, ask. Take everything to God in prayer. This is wonderful. Then listen to this. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Now make sure he's your father, you know, to as many as received him. To them gave he the right to become the sons of God, even to those that don't do any more, no less, just simply believe in his name. Just believe in the Lord Jesus, that he died for you, and that he rose again for your justification to make you a son of God, and you've been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, and you're a son of God, and you can go to him and you can say, Father. And if you ask your father for bread, he wouldn't give you a stone, or if you ask a fish, will he, for a fish, give him a serpent? Can you imagine a father that would do that? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And he told him at that time to ask for the Holy Spirit. The best I can tell, they never did ask for it. And a little later on, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. They needed the Spirit of God in those intervening days. Then on the great day of Pentecost, he came and baptized them into the body of believers, put them in Christ, and then they were filled on that day with the Holy Spirit. And the filling is something that all of us need. All believers have been baptized into the body of Christ by one Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body? Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, we've been all made to drink of one Spirit. Now, he has this incident here. We have it in Matthew. In Matthew, it brings out the notion of the unpardonable sin, so-called. There is no unpardonable sin today. But if you'll notice, but he was casting out a demon. It was dumb. came to pass when the demon was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered, some of them said, He casteth out demons through Beelzebub, the chief of the demons. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. And he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? because ye say that I cast out demons through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out demons, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. That is, 
It's among them in the presence of the person of the king who had the credentials of the king. Then he gives this, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. And that's a very important verse for this nation that we live in. There are those that want to disarm us today. There are ones that, and you need to look very carefully at these people today that don't want us to have an army or the atom bomb and want us to get rid of all the gases. Of course, these things are terrible, the gases and the bombs. But you see, a strong man armed keepeth his palace. A wicked man abroad. Here it was Beelzebub, Satan abroad. The enemy, and as long as there's an enemy, and this nation has an enemy, as long as there is, we do well to be armed. I wish we didn't have to be. I never cared about wearing a uniform. I never liked it. Tell the truth, I hated a uniform. But I tell you, there is a period in your life when you need to wear one <laughs> for the sake of your country. I disagree with the philosophy of the present hour today because a strong man arm keepeth his palace and his goods are in peace. We had a great deal of discussion whether a man should have a gun in his home. I say he should have. Strong man arm keepeth his house. If the enemy knows that he can't cross the threshold of my home and hurt my loved one without paying a terrible price for it, he won't come over the threshold. I'd like for him to know it, too. Then you have the worthlessness here of so-called self-reformation. We've had that before in Matthew, the unclean spirit that went out of a man, and the man was empty. The haunted house. That's the condition of a lot of these people today that think they lead a good life. They're just like a haunted house. And then he tells them about the sign of the prophet Jonah. That was the sign for the day in which he was. And that sign was resurrection, of course, for that's what that teaches. Then we have that which we've had before in both Matthew and Mark, the parable of the lighted candle, and I'll not even deal with it in this study. And he denounces woes again upon the Pharisees. We had those in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. And now the Lord denounces woes upon the lawyers. He was hard on the lawyers, was he not? And so we have that, and that closes this chapter here. Verse 45, Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, Thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. You know, it's one thing to tell somebody else what to do. It's another thing to do it yourself. That's a thing that we preachers have to be so careful about, is to make sure we're not preaching something that is not a part of our own experience. And that is what our Lord is talking about here. Now, friends, I'm going to break off at this particular juncture today because we've been over this ground, and I'm so anxious in this gospel to pay attention to that which is not found anywhere else because it's so rich, and there's so many things here that are yet to come before us that you'll not find anywhere else, and we want to give time to those. So we'll take up next time chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke, and I do hope that you'll write in and ask for the notes and outlines, and then tell a friend about the program, ask them to tune in. You are our missionary, whoever you are and wherever you are. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The notes and outlines Dr. McGee mentioned are available in our digital book now called Briefing the Bible. If you want to download it, you can do it anytime. Just go to ttb.org forward slash resources, or you can call 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll send you an abbreviated copy by mail. And if you visit ttb.org, be sure to download a copy of our companion, our Bible companion, that is, for Luke. It's really a great way to go deeper in all that we're learning in this terrific gospel. Now, are you on social media? I know, I know it's not exactly known for the good news that it spreads throughout the world, but it is time that we brighten up the narrative with God's Word, don't you think? 
Well, you can follow Through the Bible on Facebook. You can do it on Instagram or Twitter to receive some really good news from Dr. McGee and God's Word every single day. Next time, the Bible bus picks up in Luke 12, so join us and invite someone else to come along with you. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Our study today was made possible through your prayer and financial support. We'll meet you back here next time. In fact, we're going to do this together, Lord willing, till Jesus comes again. In which case, we'll meet you in the air.